anybody, is anybody in here who could use just a little bit of encouragement today? Um, I bet you in a crowd this size, there are folks who just say, man, I really could. Well, I want to applaud you first uh, for, for if you are feeling discouragement today, that you at least came out to the church. You came out to God's local assembly right here at Journey Church. Uh, in spite of the fact that you may be feeling a little bit discouraged, I was... Um, I actually thought about this at the last minute, this story. Um, this story talks about how it is that the devil's number one tool in his toolbox is discouragement. Listen to this little short story. It goes like this. It says, the devil announced a going out of business sale. And of course, we know that that's not true, but just follow the story. He laid out all of his tool, the tools of his trade with price tags for anyone to purchase. There was hatred, jealousy, envy, greed, pride, and more and a nasty bunch of devices, all for a price, each one with a price tag. Some of the tools were pretty complicated items with buttons, spinners, ratchets, and gears. But one of the tools was surprisingly simple. It was just a simple wedge that looked a lot like a doorstop. It was very worn, scratched, and scuffed. It had been used numerous times. It was more expensive than all of the other high-tech tools. Someone asked the devil, what is this one? He said, that's discouragement. Why is it so expensive? The devil said, because it is more useful to me than any of the others. Many people can see the other tools coming and stop me, but with discouragement, I sneak up on them a little at a time, slowly pry them open, get inside where I can use the other tools. Now, this last part I thought was good. When someone gets discouraged, the devil said, they make excuses. I get them. Or they cheat, and I get them. Or they get jealous of other people and I get them, or they just completely quit, and I get them. You know, it's, um, maybe this is more out of the ministry, more, maybe this is more for pastors as they go through summertime. Sometimes pastors can get really discouraged. But we all need a word of encouragement. You'll never meet anyone in this life who doesn't need encouragement. I believe that because one of the spiritual gifts that the Bible says God gave to us as the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of people, one of, the Holy, one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings to people is the gift of encouragement. I believe that is because that in God's church, God wanted for there to be numerous people who their primary gift to that church would be that they're encouragers. Because we all know this, we live in a world where it does get discouraging. We need to come to church. You know, you hear people say this, oh, you one of them feel-good preachers? Which I want to ask, well, what do you... How do you want to leave church? You want to leave feeling bad every week? I mean, yeah, there's a time for conviction. There's a time to preach a strong message and people get convicted. But by and large, I don't know about you, but I'd love to come to church and leave more encouraged than I got there. And really, when you look at the Bible, you see that there's so many stories and scriptures and promises that God has given to us in His Word simply to encourage us. God knew that we'd be sitting in places like this week in and week out. And we'd be going through difficulty in our family, relationships, jobs, whatever it might be. And that people would constantly be in need of being encouraged. So this morning what I want to do is I want to teach from one of the most uh, encouraging stories in all of the Bible. I want to teach this morning from the story of David and Goliath. Now, everybody in here has heard this before, haven't you? You've heard a story, you've heard a sermon on David and Goliath. You heard it at vacation Bible school, Sunday school. Every once in a while, a preacher may come by like me and come in and preach a message. And I don't want this to be like a candy stick message. Years ago, I wrote a little book about that thick called From Cheese Carrier to Champion. You can't even get it anymore. The publisher went out of business. But, but I wrote that because I was a young pastor, young preacher, not even a pastor yet, who was discouraged. Didn't know what God was going to do with my life. I just graduated from Liberty University, kind of discouraged about what was next. And this story really did change my life, the principles of it. Now, I want to be fair when I, when I teach on David, all right? We all know this. David was a complex person. And we can talk about this David and Goliath and how wonderful it was. We can flip just a few chapters over and we can see that while he could defeat a nine-foot, six-inch giant, he really struggled with those five, seven brunettes, didn't he? 
So we always need to be fair to Scripture. David was a fascinating individual. I mean, when he was good, he was good. When he was bad, he was really bad. And, and so, but in this story, the story of David and Goliath, I believe that this story is a microcosm of the Christian life. I believe that this story from front to end, we find principles in this story that anyone in this room this morning who's willing right now to say, Spirit of God, speak to me. And anyone in this room this morning can gain some insight today that will help you as a follower of Christ. Because this whole story is just filled with what it takes to be what I would call a champion for God. Not a champion for you, not for your glory, but how you can be uh, used to the greatest of your potential for the Lord. I titled that little book I wrote from Cheese Carrier to Champion, and then the subtitle was how God uses the improbable to do the impossible. How God chooses to use the most improbable people in this world, and that's us, by the way. God chooses to use the most improbable people in the world to do some of His most impossible tasks. He uses people like that, just normal, average, ordinary people for His glory. So what I want to do today is let's take a look at the story of David and Goliath. This story begins, when you look at it, it begins um, in a way sometimes that is, that's overlooked. We, we think, sometimes because we don't just read the whole story, we think that David when he got to the battlefield that day to face Goliath, we think David was already this great warrior. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, David was nothing more. All he had ever done was play a musical instrument and keep sheep. In fact, you're going to see in just a little while, his oldest brother said that David was so unskilled that his father would not even give him a lot of sheep. He'd just give him a few sheep to take care of because he wasn't even capable of taking care of many sheep. And, and yet, when, when we open the story, David is um, at a, on a battlefield. How did he get there? How did David ever even get to Goliath? That's a great question to ask in this story. How did he ever, was it like that, you know, he was recruited or drafted? We think so Western-like that we think was David drafted into the Jewish army so he could go, go fight Goliath? No. You know how David got to the battlefield that day? He got to the battlefield because his father, Jesse, we can't even fathom this in our way of doing war today, his father, Jesse, said to him all the way back in Bethlehem, he said, he said, David, I want for you to go out to the battlefield, and I want for you to take some cheese and some bread and food, of course, and I want you to take it out to your brothers and to their commanders. Again, we don't operate like this today. Our government takes care of all of that. And I want you to take your brother's food, their commanders. I want you to, to get a report from them on how the battle's going. And I, then I want you to come back. So here's the simple truth. I want for you to take cheese, get a report, come back to Bethlehem, tell me how it's going. So here's, here's the way we see that. David was on just kind of a mundane errand for his father. Let's put that passage of Scripture on the screen and just kind of look at how that unfolded. It says, early in the morning, David left the flock flock of sheep in the care of a shepherd. He loaded up and he set out as Jesse, his father, had directed him. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. So David gets to the battlefield about the time that the two sides are coming together to fight. Goliath and the Philistines and the, and, and the Jewish army are about to come together to fight. It says this, And Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. So now you can, you can get the picture. They're getting ready to come together and fight. Next verse. said, David left his things when he got to the battlefield with the keeper of the supplies. He ran to the battle lines and he asked his brothers how they were. So he's just fulfilling what his daddy told him to do. Next, next verse. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine, the uh, champion from Goth, stepped out from his lines, shouted his usual defiance. So he was, he was coming out defying the armies of Israel. And this is really important. Don't miss this part. Three little words after the comma. And David heard it. And David heard it. So back up with me for a minute. I, I'm, I'm trying to make a lot of this so that you understand the importance of this principle. When David gets out there, David is not out there to fight. David is on what would have been considered a very mundane, average, ordinary task just to take cheese to his brothers and come back. 
in the process of that, this opportunity to fight Goliath opened up. In other words, the opportunity for him to the opportunity for him to serve the Lord, to do what God had called him to do, presented itself while he was doing something altogether different. It's, sometimes it's hard to communicate, and I hope that you're, you're understanding this. Let me give you a story to illustrate this. When I was at Liberty University in the early 1990s, I was one of the few people on campus who had a vehicle, and um, so a lot of people would ask me to go and pick them up from the airport. When I was at Liberty, you could not even have a, um, couldn't even have a TV in your room. I mean, this is in the dark ages. And so whenever there was a football game on on Saturdays, my roommate and I would have to go down to a Applebee's and watch football games. So there was a Saturday came up, and we were going to go to this um, Applebee's to watch the game. Well, we walked in, of course, sat down. I wasn't paying attention to the game because the one we wanted to see was not on yet. And my roommate looked at me and said, Hey, Austin, look, man, this guy just blocked a punt on television. Well, I'd seen a lot of punts, but that is something that's kind of different. So I looked up. Replay came on. This guy stretched out blocking a punt on the football game. Well, we watched our game, went back to our room. The next day was Sunday, and I was scheduled to go to Roanoke, Virginia, to the little regional airport there in Roanoke, to pick up a friend of mine who was flying back in from Dallas. Well, I walked into the airport. I was going to study for a little while, so I opened up some book, I don't even remember what it was, and I was studying there in the airport. This guy walks up. I mean, he is, he is fit. He was about 6'3", 210 pounds. I like to tell people, he is what my order um, to look like in heaven looks like. I wanna, that's what I want to look like in heaven. So he's, this, he's this big, you know, muscular guy, and he, he walks up to me real friendly, and he says, hey, man, what's your name? And I stuck my hand out and said, I'm Austin Deloach. His name was Will Farrell. That's why I'll never forget his name. He said, well, I'm Will Farrell, Not that Will Farrell, all right? But he said, um, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm a Bible student at Liberty University studying, to, studying the Scripture. I'm going to be a pastor. And I said, he said, really? I said, yeah. He said, you mind if I sit down and ask you a few questions? I said, no, man. I said, I'd love for you to. I mean, that's not usually how witnessing opportunities happen, is it? So he was so open. He said, I'm Catholic, and I understand you're Protestant. Can you? He started out the conversation by saying, can you just... As, explain to me the difference between what I'm supposed to believe, because he really didn't even know what he believed. He said, what I'm supposed to believe as a Catholic and what you believe. And so I told him that. And of course, it presented a great opportunity to share Christ with him or share the Bible with him, Bible verses. And that's what I did. I gave him some Bible verses to read and to study because he was really interested, I mean, really engaged. About that time, the plane came in for one of us. I don't remember who. And we got up to walk down to where one of us was going to... Um, pick up who we were there to pick up. He looked at me and he said, hey man, he said, do you get the Roanoke Times in Lynchburg? I said, well, I can, I can get a copy. He said, I want you to stop and get a copy, look on the front page of the sports section. Sure enough, we went to the Western Sizzle. I don't even know if they exist anymore. We went to Western Sizzle to eat and I picked up a copy of the Roanoke Times, opened it up, front page of the sports section. That was him stretched out blocking the punt the day before out in the restaurant. Now, Stop right there for just a minute. Here's what some people would say. Boy, boy, Brother Austin, this sure is a small world, isn't it? Do you, can I ask you, does anybody really believe that? Does anybody really believe that that was a coincidence? That it was sheer coincidence that made me run into a guy that I just happened to be watching on television the day before and my roommate just happened to say, hey, look at that guy blocking that punt. Does anybody really just believe that that just happened? No, because, see, with God, things don't just happen. With God, God is orderly. God arranges things. There are divine opportunities that come our way all of the time as we're going about our little mundane tasks, our everyday little things in life. God presents numerous opportunities. I was talking to someone just in the back right here. What would happen if the average Christian in this place went out this week with a divine awareness of what God might want to do with you, listen, at any given moment, any given moment, that I know you think you're just there to earn your paycheck, you think you're just there to pick up that loaf of bread in Walmart or wherever you shop, you think you're just there in any given place. What if it is that God has chosen to do the majority of the work that He does in this world as we're going about our mundane task and then God presents an opportunity for us? I told the earlier service I was... Not too terribly long ago, I pulled up to a gas station in Valdosta to get gas. Y'all ever done this? You know, we've all done this. 
we'll say, get out and see someone, and we may say, hey, how are you doing? How, how are you doing? Well, we really, we're really not, most of the time, we're really not asking that, are we? Kind of like just a figure of speech. Hey, how are you doing is more like just, hey, how, you know, how are things going? But you're not expecting them to unload the last month on you. So I got out, pumping gas. There's this girl, you know how if you're pumping gas here, there's somebody on the other side. And I just kindly looked at her and spoke, and I said, hey, how are you doing? And man, when I did, this young girl looked like she was in her mid-20s. She just began to flood with tears. And I'll never forget this. She said to me, I'm not doing so good. She said, you might have seen me, my name, in the paper about Austin Daily Times. She said, my kids have been taken from me. She said, my life is a disaster. Now, can I ask everybody in this room a question who really wants to, who really believes that God is actively working in people's lives? Does anybody really believe that I was just there that day to pump gas? No. No, it was about more than gas. It was about what God was doing in the moment, what God was presenting, the opportunity God was presenting to me to minister to other people in a given moment. It used to be Harvey's in Homerville, now Piggly Wiggly. That's a big deal in Homerville. I told him earlier, that makes the front page of the paper. Uh, we've changed from Harvey's to Piggly Wiggly. That's the biggest change that's happened in Homerville in a decade. But I go there a lot to buy groceries. I probably pray with more people in Harvey's than I do in our church. Say, what has that got to do with anything? It's got, again, it has to do with everything. These opportunities that we have that God brings to us, just like David, David is only there. Just read your Bible. It's very clear. David is only there as a little teenage shepherd boy to go out and just take cheese. And when he gets out there to take the cheese, God presents this glorious opportunity now for him to get involved in the battle, and we know what happened. The story of David and Goliath is really the story of how God positioned David to become the king. If you read it, David's been anointed king for we don't know how long when he gets there. But the story of David and Goliath and Goliath, David defeating Goliath was just the way that God positioned David to eventually become the king of Israel. It was a test that God used in the process of bringing David to the kingdom. Because we know this, don't we? A faith that hasn't been tested cannot be trusted. We're always fighting against the difficult challenges of life, and we always are trying to get all the Goliaths out of our life, and yet Goliath many times is what we have to go through to get to where God wants us to where we can be used. Because we have to go through tests if we're really going to be used by God. Nobody in here wants to go to a lawyer or a surgeon. You walk into his office and say, Hey, how many of these have you done? He says, None. Nobody wants that. We all trust people that we know have been tested more than anyone else. And this was a part of David's test, and David steps up to the challenge. And if we don't have time to read the entire story, but David steps up to the challenge here, and, and everybody else is running from Goliath and running from the giant, and they all have these shields and these swords and all this stuff, and they're running, and David doesn't have anything. And even though he has nothing material to show, David says, I'll fight him. I'll defeat him. Who is this giant who's making fun and making a mockery of the God that I love? Who, who does he think he is? And David says, I'll fight him. You know, this is just like one of those moments of uh, David stepping up to fight Goliath. This is like one of those moments where some of you have had in your life with God, isn't it? Where you've stepped up and you said, man, I'll go on that mission trip. I'll teach that small group. I'll do this. God's calling me to God's calling me to do this. And in those moments like that, we get so excited, don't we? We're so excited that God has called us to do something. What we don't factor in is that every time God calls someone, you become a candidate for discouragement. Every time God gets active in your life and you get serious about serving God, you don't have to be a preacher. You, anyone in this room today as a layperson just says, man, I want for God to use me as a businessman, as a mother, as a whatever you may be, a teenager. Then here's what you become a candidate for. You become a candidate for discouragement. And I want to give you a good word this morning. I want you to write this down on your, in your mind. 
Never assume that people who finished strong for God never wanted to quit. Billy Graham. Never assume that Billy Graham, even though he finished so strong, never assume that there wasn't a time in his life, in the midst of all God was doing in his life, that he didn't want to quit. My chancellor, Jerry Falwell, who is one of the most faith-filled men I've ever known in my life, never assumed that though he built this entire university that's changing the world and he finished strong, that he never wanted to quit. By the way, let me, let me mention this to you. Anybody ever heard of Moses? Yeah, you don't have to be a Christian, do you? You don't even have to be a Christian to know the word Moses. Moses, the great writer of the law, the great deliverer of God's people out of Exodus, this great leader. Check your Bible out. He asked God to kill him. Google it. He got, he got so discouraged, he came to a point in his own ministry, said, God, I'm tired of dealing with these people. I'm tired of dealing with ministry. Would you just kill me? Some of you are saying, I thought this was on encouragement, Brother Austin. Hey, anybody ever heard of Elijah? Yeah, you have. You, again, you don't even have to be a Christian. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, gets under a juniper tree because he's so discouraged and asks God to kill him to the greatest figures of the Old Testament. About six, seven years ago, I could take you to the place that our vehicle was parked. I looked at my wife, Jennifer, and I said to her, I'm quitting. I'm finished. It was the week between Christmas and New Year's. Boy, don't you know that would bless your wife. I'm quitting. I'm, fin I'm tired of it. I'm tired of all the opinions because everybody has one. I'm, I'm tired of all the criticism because some people do that so well you think they're getting paid for it. I'm just tired of all the challenges. Everybody thinks they know everything. It's just, I, I just can't do it anymore. You'll, you'll think that I'm lying to you. Here was my dream. I just wanted to go to Walmart and put happy stickers on people. Who can get criticized for that? I'm telling you, I had dreams at night of just saying, hey, this is all I want to do. That's a great job, by the way, if you have it. Just want to pop happy stickers on people when they walk in the door. I'm just tired of it. I want to quit. I'll never forget what she said. She said, you're not quitting anything. She said, God called you to this, Austin, and you'll stop doing this when God calls you to stop. And see, all of us have been there, haven't we? Everybody's been in the place in your life when you just want to throw the towel in on that marriage or throw the towel in on that ministry and you were just to the point that the discouragement had been there for so long that you just finally said, I want to quit. And you say, well, Austin, what, where does that factor into here? Well, here's what's interesting about this story. David steps up to the plate. He says, I'll fight Goliath. And the first thing that happens, not the second thing that happens, first thing that happens is two people walk into his life and immediately begin to discourage him. You know, you'd think, wouldn't you, that they would have said, yay, come on, David, David, you're the man. That he'd had one of those moments where everybody would have been behind him. But no, Eliab, his oldest brother, let's get that on the screen. Eliab, his oldest brother, and Saul, the king of Israel, began to discourage him from fighting Goliath. Notice what it says here on the screen. It says, when Eliab, David's oldest brother... Listen real, real close. I can't get all of this in in one message. He's still mad because he didn't get chosen to be king. He's got anger in his heart. He's got that stuff in his heart that will kill anybody in this room. He's got bitterness in his heart. And it's eating him up from the inside out. And it says that when he heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and he asked, David, why have you come down here? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? There it is, those few sheep. I know that you're conceited. How wicked your heart is. He's an old great reader of hearts. And I know that you came down here to watch the battle. Can everybody just, gosh, I wish we had more time. Every bit of that's a false accusation. Not one thing Eliab said to David is true. He didn't come down there out of the pride of his heart. He actually came there out of humility. He didn't come down there to watch the battle. He came to bring him some cheese. Everything that Eli was saying to him is a false accusation. 
And, and that doesn't discourage David. In fact, David stays laser-focused on what he believes God would have him to do. Go to the next verse, if you would. Look at what happens next. It says that David says to him, What have I done? Can't I even speak? One translation says that David asked the question, Is there not a cause? Well, you'd think that that would be enough to discourage David to not fight Goliath. But look what happens next. Go to the next verse. It says he turned away to someone else who brought up the same matter. So in other words, y'all know how that works. Now everybody's chiming in, saying the same thing, and the men answered before. What David said was overheard, reported, here it is, reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. So let me slow down for a minute. Who is Saul? Listen, everybody. Saul is the king of the nation. No one in the entire kingdom of Israel respected Saul more than David did. So here you've had David's oldest brother trying to discourage David. Now you have the king of the nation. Look what he says to him. Go, go to the next verse. He begins to try to discourage him. It says that David said to Saul, Don't let anyone lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go fight him. Can you imagine this teenage boy, never been trained, doesn't have all the credentials, has absolutely no armor, doesn't even own a sword, he owns a musical instrument. Look, look what it says. I'll go fight him. Go to, go to the next verse. And Saul replied. Listen to what Saul says. Saul says, you're not able. You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. Well, that's some strong words coming from the king, isn't it? You're not able to do this. He says, you're only a young man, and he's been a warrior from his youth. In other words, hey, David, he's been doing this a long time. You don't even have a chance. Go to the next verse, if you will. And David looks back at Saul and says, Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. A lion or a bear came out and carried off his sheep from the flock. Look what happens. Next verse. I went after it. I struck it. I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, look at this next part. I seized it by its hair. Anybody say, boy, that's something, isn't it? Seize a lion or a bear by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Next part, though. David's going to give credit where credit's due. He says, your servant, Saul, has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Here's what he says. He's trying to discourage him. Saul's telling him you can't do it. In a crowd this size, man, listen to me. There's no telling how many of you have been told those words in your life. Because the moment God tells you you can do something or you should do something, you just watch out. There's going to come those who are going to tell you you can't. And the real question is going to believe this. This is really important. The real question is this. Are you going to believe God or are you going to believe them? And everybody's going to come to those places when you really start following Jesus. Everyone's going to come to that place where you're going to have to either trust what you know God said or you start believing what people say. And here's what David does. David says, you know what, Saul? I hear what you're saying, and you're exactly right. If it was just, if it was just me versus Goliath, you're exactly right. I, I couldn't beat him. He is a man of war. But then he tells him a little story. You know what the story's about? The story is about something that God had done in David's past. And he says, hey, listen, the same God who helped me defeat the lion and the bear with my bare hands is the same God who is going to empower me to defeat this giant. This is not between me and Goliath. This is really between God and Goliath. And he goes back down memory lane, and he encourages himself by the faithfulness that he has seen God have in his past. See, listen, as Christians a lot of times... We forget what we should remember, and we remember what we should forget. I mean, just like in a crowd like this, the enemy's beating some of you over the head about past failures and sins, and you just can't get over it. You can't really receive Romans 8, 1, that says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You read it, but you wake up every day under the guilt and the shame and the condemnation of your past failures, and you never have the freedom that God meant for you to have in Christ. So we remember what we should forget. We just live under a cloud that God came to take away. But man, we also 
need to learn how to recall those times that we have seen God. We personally have seen God show up in our life, our marriage, whatever it might have been. And we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was God. That's what David's saying here. He's saying, Saul, I've seen the hand of God. And the same God who was faithful then, he's going to be faithful now. Hey, can I ask Journey Church a question? Just individually. How many of you in this place, have, you know this, don't raise your hand if you can't say this, how many of you have ever seen, you, you experienced, you know that it was God who showed up in a circumstance of your life? Look at this. Look all around. You know He showed up. Listen, September 22nd will be two years. I had a tumor the size of a peach at the base of my brain that was about to wrap around the stem of my brain and went in for major brain surgery. Not that there is a minor brain surgery. And went in and opened up my skull and took out that tumor and put some type of cement back in my head. I mean, I went through that full experience and I went to my follow-up appointment with my brain surgeon. I'm not talking here about just anybody. My brain surgeon, one of the chief brain surgeons in this state. And he looked at me and he said, son, he's a Catholic, Italian Catholic doctor. He said, hey man, he said, death came for you. He said, it just was not your time. God wasn't ready for you. But I've been in your brain. And death was all over it. Hey, you mean to tell me, Journey Church, that I'm supposed to forget that? That I'm supposed to forget that God came through and that God healed my body? You mean I'm just supposed to let that go and never bring it up, never think about it? Am I supposed to forget that 10 years ago our marriage was so bad we already had our lawyer that we had named that we were going to use so we could finish the divorce? And God came in and changed my heart and changed my wife's heart and I don't know anybody who has a greater marriage today. Am I supposed to forget that? Are you supposed to forget what God's done for you? Are you supposed to forget how faithful God has shown up in your life and not pull those times into the present? So this is, all, this is all David's doing. All David is doing is saying, Hey, Saul, I've seen the faithfulness of God. And the God who showed up then is the God who's going to show up now. Because, hey, everybody listen to me. Because he was saying God was faithful then and God does not change. He was faithful then and he'll always be faithful. One of the funniest things, things about my ministry. When I first went in the ministry, years, light years, many years ago, it seemed like the only doors that would open up for me to preach in was Pentecostal churches. Anybody raised in a Pentecostal church? A few of you. I'd go into these churches and in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a song that was real popular in the Pentecostal churches called He'll Do It Again. I'm just interested. It's not a big deal. Does anybody remember that song, He'll Do It Again? That's interesting. A few of you remember. About that many in the last service, too. But that song, here's what it did. I'm getting these old Pentecostal services, and these folks would get up, and they'd begin to sing, He'll Do It Again. And the, 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 that song goes kind of like this. It, it, it builds up. And it'd go, it would go, it would recount the faithfulness of God. And it'd say, just like, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it would be building, building, building. And then when it would get to the end of that, the punchline would come in and they'd say, and he'll do it again. And boy, when he would, them old Pentecostal churches. I told them they'd start spiking hymnals, throwing babies from the balcony. Bobby pins start flying everywhere. If you've ever been in one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And man, when they did, they'd hit that line. And they'd be the most encouraging spirit sweep through that room because through song you were reminding yourself that he has always been faithful and he will always be faithful. He'll do it again. And that's all David is saying here. David is saying, God got me through all of those battles on the sheep field and he'll do it again. And you know what, church? He will. Some of you came in here this morning discouraged and you need, need to be reminded that God has always been faithful to His people and He hasn't changed. Later on in this story, the actual battle starts. David does, in fact, walk out to the battlefield if you've ever read it. He gets out to the battlefield. Him and, him and Goliath get into this. It almost looks like you know some of the things that go on in 
on television today, whether it's a boxing match or some of that full contact stuff where they have the, the pre-fight. The pre-fight's funner to watch than the fight, isn't it? Where two people start jawing at each other. And so in this story, you can read it. You see where Goliath comes to David and says, Hey, David, I'm, gonna, I'm not only going to defeat you, I'm going to feed every one of you Jews to the birds. I'm going to defeat you. And then David comes back with his line. And he says, You know what? You come to me with a sword and a spear, Goliath. He says, But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then he looks at Goliath. And at the end of the story, he says, Goliath, the battle is the Lord's. Boy, I tell you, this right here would set some people free in this room this morning. I watch Christians fight their own battles. I pastored for so long, I watched people do it. I've watched myself do it where you just have assumed full responsibility for the battle. And you know what? I love you enough to come by here and tell you. You can't win them all by yourself. Hey, that's what, makes, that's what makes our faith so great. David looks at Goliath and says, This battle belongs to the Lord. And David literally hands the battle to the Lord. That's what some folks in here need to do this morning. By faith, you need to give your battle to Jesus. He has never lost one and he's not going to start now. And some folks in here, you're worn out, you're beat down, and one of the reasons you are is because you've just assumed total responsibility and you've been fighting, fighting, fighting. And God brought you to Journey Church this morning for somebody to stand up and tell you, you need to give this battle to the Lord. And when I say give it, that doesn't mean come and present it to Him and then when you get home today, take it back. It means that you give the battle to the Lord and you give God the space and the time that He needs and you only do what He tells you to do. But you don't assume full responsibility for the battle. And you know what happens, don't you? The Bible says that He gives the battle to the Lord. David steps back, takes a little slingshot. A little slingshot. Whirls it around his head, lets the stone go. This is interesting. Read it, you can read it for yourself. The Bible says that the rock hits Goliath in the forehead and he falls flat on his face. It doesn't even make sense. Hits him in his forehead, he falls flat down. One writer said that because of David's faith and because God had assumed responsibility to defeat Goliath because of David's faith, that when the rock hit him in the head, God hit him in the back of the head and knocked him flat on his face. And God defeated Goliath. See, here's what we've always said, haven't we? We have always said that this was a battle between David and Goliath. I understand that, and I'm not here to argue that. But at the end of the story, at the end of the story, this is not a battle between David and Goliath. This is a battle between God and Goliath. Because David said, I gave the battle to the Lord. Not me, it's him. Not me fighting him. I'm just an instrument in God's hand. But at the end of the day, the victory of this battle belongs to the Lord. And man, I'm ready to see some of God's people set free. I'm ready to see some of God's people by faith do what David here and learn how to entrust your battles to the Lord. Those internal things that you fight that maybe no one else knows about. That struggle that you have in life that just seems like you struggle every day with it. To learn how to give that to the Lord by faith to transfer that to the Lord. You can do that this morning. You can do that today. You know, at the end of the day, the Bible says that David's real asset is found in 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel 16, let's place that on the screen and we'll close with this. The guys can come if they, if they can. 1 Samuel 16, the Bible says that God is looking for the next king of Israel. He's trying to find who's going who's to be the second king. Because if you've ever read the story, you know that Saul was a disaster. Saul was chosen by God. He was this big man. He looked like a king. Big shoulders, tall, distinguished. And he had all the outer features of a great king. Here was the problem. 
he had none of the inner qualities that it took. He was prideful. You know, pride destroys everything it touches. Everything. He was angry. He was jealous of David. I mean, he was he, just everything internally that could be wrong, he had it. So God finally said, you know what? God said, I have had enough of Saul. And the scripture says that he removes the anointing from Saul. And then he does this. He looks to and fro throughout the whole Israel and he says, I'm going to choose the second king now. I'm going to choose the second man that I want to use as the king of Israel. He sends Samuel out to a little, little town. Bethlehem is getting larger now, but then it was just like a little, small little town. Ty Ty. Y'all know where that is. Just a little old hole in the ground. If you're from Tai Tai, it's a beautiful little town. But just a little small place. And God says, Samuel, I want for you to go to Bethlehem. It's so big to us because it's where Jesus was born. But really it was nothing. A little farm town. Samuel gets out there to Bethlehem. Goes out into the, to, to Jesse's farm. Says to Jesse, hey Jesse. God told me as the prophet, one of your sons is the next king of Israel. One of your sons is the next king. You see the story. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height. Why was that? Because everybody thought Eliab was going to be him. Eliab was the oldest, most experienced. Samuel said, surely this is him. And God says to Samuel, don't consider the appearance of his height. I've rejected him. The, the Lord does not look at things people look at. You know what people look at? Everybody listen to me. People look at resumes to determine everything. I'm not saying that's not important, but that's how they make their decision. Oh, he's got this many degrees. Surely he's the one. People look at experience. Boy, he's got all of this experience. Surely he's the one. Oh, he's handsome. Surely he's the one. Oh, she's beautiful. Surely she's the one. And God is saying to Samuel, people always look on the outward appearance. Look what he says. He said, people look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the what? The heart. And you know what he's looking for in the heart? He's looking for humility. He's looking for faith. He's looking for people who have a heart for him. And all the way back in 1 Samuel 16, God said, right down there in that little sheep field, keeping those few little sheep, Listen, everybody, I don't know what this does to you, but this blows my mind. He said, I have found a king. I found a king. I have found someone that I can use. And nobody else is going to think it's him. God says, I'm looking at things they're not looking at. And he chooses him, and he calls him, and he becomes one of the greatest kings Israel ever had. I'm done. This morning, I want to encourage you because some of you, you are discouraged. But I want to encourage you to keep on. I want to encourage you as a church, Journey Church right here in Tiff. I want to encourage you to go out tomorrow, even out of here today, with a divine awareness of what God may want to do in your life every moment of every day. Stop seeing ministry as an event and start seeing ministry as a lifestyle. It's something that you do in the process of your life. Hey, for the people who walked in here this morning, you've been discouraged. I pray that the Spirit of God will encourage you this morning through this message. Those who want to quit, you'll find the courage, you'll find the strength you need today to keep on keeping on. Some of you need to give the battle to the Lord. That's the only reason you're here today is for this preacher to tell you you've assumed responsibility for the battle and it is wearing you out. And God's saying to you today, by faith, you need to hand the battle to the Lord and watch what God can do it when you give it to Him. He's faithful. I love you. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to serve the Lord with this church. What is God saying to you this morning? Father, in Jesus' name, speak to your people, I pray. Use this church, use this ministry for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen.